So I want to tell you about today, oh, by the way, the background I changed because I was looking for something that kind of matched my, my new book. Okay, here's the sales pitch. The Tattoo Murder, which takes place in Ventura. I guess you can't really see that. Um, the Tattoo Murder, which takes place in Ventura. And uh, that is my new book. And uh, it is a fictional account of a, of a murder. And it takes place, body washes up on the shore, right near where that background was taken. So that's the sales pitch. All right, get that out of the way. The story I want to tell you about today is um, about the 1988 Olympics. And it's a bigger story uh, than the Olympics itself in that it's two stories. It's one about the historic element uh, of the 1988 Olympics. And I was working for the UPI radio network at the time. And it's also about one of the biggest event that happened at the Olympics, which I happened to be one of the events that I actually covered. And um, when we got there, I mean, I was part of the management team as well as the broadcast team. So I was the number two guy in charge. I was in charge of handling all the assignments, who covered what events. We had a whole team of like eight people uh, who covered, you know, the swimming, who covered the diving, who covered the track, you know, uh, and who covered the opening ceremonies, who covered the closing ceremonies. And that was my job, as well as covering some of those events myself. And we, of course, knew there were going to be uh, political demonstrations, which we had to cover and uh, that type of thing, too. So I had to take all that into account and uh, make out the daily schedule. And I had been working on this for a year. So uh, I had, had it really down to the T. And uh, just so that in case anything happened and we knew something would happen, that we'd be able to adjust in rapid form. And it worked, worked like a charm. It was probably one of the best jobs I've ever done. Matter of fact, one of the guys um, who was under me, one of the reporters said, Bob, this is the most organized event I've ever covered. Matter of fact, you almost organized the fun right out of it. <laughs> so, uh, and he spent his last night uh, in Seoul um, at one of the casinos gambling. So, and all night long. And, and got on a plane. So, uh, but that was Ed Karens. And Ed was a great guy who uh, worked in New York. But we had a, a team. We brought in um, not only UPI guys, but there was a two person team from one of the radio stations um, that uh, was part of the network. So, but John Todd is my very good friend who passed away a couple of years ago uh, at a very young age, unfortunately. Uh, was the, he was the sports director, so he was number one. And hopefully I'll have some pictures here for you uh, in the uh, video portion uh, of this to show you uh, me and John in, uh, in Seoul. So anyway, we got there, John and I got there along with the engineers who were going to build the studios for us like three weeks before the Olympics or two weeks before the Olympics. So we were there and we, you know, tasted the hamburgers and everything. But I told John, I said, look, we have to go up to the Peace Village at Pan Moom John on the border. You know, we'll work with the army. We'll get a uh, tour up there. We'll get to go. And fortunately, they had already that set up, so it was easy to do. And of course, that's where the negotiations take place, if there aren't any negotiations. And that was where the ceasefire, which um, didn't end the war with Korea, but it put a halt to it. It's ceasefire. The war never has officially ended. Uh, there was no winner, no loser. And there are border guards on both sides armed with guns. They look at each other every day and the whole nine yards. So John and I took the trip up there and it was fabulous. Um, we got to go in the building. First of all, they tell you, you can't make hand signals. You can't, uh, you have to wear a tie. Uh, we would have to wear dresses, you know, uh, because they don't want, because uh, you're being taken, photos are being taken of you by the North Koreans on the other side of the border. And if, the, the pitch is that if they see you dressed or shabbily or you make some gestures, that'll be used in propaganda to the people who live in North Korea, that people in the West, the people in South Korea are just, you know, they're scum, you know, and uh, the way of North Korea is the way that life should be. So uh, we had to play by all these rules. That was fine. We, we did. We had the respect to do that and the integrity. And then we got in, they took us down to the building, which half the building is in North Korea and half the building is in South Korea. And we were allowed to go to the other side of the building. So we got some pictures taken and hopefully, like I said, I'll have those up um, of us in North Korea. So I could actually say one of the countries I visited in my life is North Korea. So, um, and that, that, that's part of the story that's going to take place in the next part of this story. First of all, 
going to North Korea, I love the Korean people. I studied, you know, language and everything before we went, so I could speak enough to get by. Um, but it was different. It was different than going to Europe or, or other places. And I'll just leave it at that. It was a little different. It was different culture and different mindset. And we had some issues, you know, and they hated NBC because they felt NBC's coverage of the Olympics was very bad and uh, gave a wrong um, opinion of the Korean people. And there were some instances. And but we had, you know, we had a boxing match where a fight broke out and it was a melee. And it was a riot. You know, so uh, we covered that and NBC, of course, covered that. And that was a news story. That was not just a sports story, an Olympic story. That was a news story. People got hurt. Punches were thrown. It was a literal riot at the boxing matches. The big event through the whole thing, and there were many of them. Um, we had the Greg Luganis story and where he hit his head. And um, that was the, and he, he bled. And that the big thing there was, you know, uh, Greg is, is gay, well known, uh, and uh, blood on in the pool. Well, there was always that was the time when AIDS was still a big deal, you know, as far as very little known about AIDS, and not that Greg had AIDS, uh, not, not that we're saying that, but um, blood in the pool and the combination of that and AIDS that that became a, a serious concern for a lot of folks, and so it was part of the story we had to cover. Um, there were political stories involved. There were daily demonstrations. And uh, it, was, it was just the most jam-packed news sports event that I'd ever been a part of and may ever have been a part of. Um, but so I got to cover the 100-meter uh, dash, which Carl Lewis was expected to win that. And his main competition was coming from Ben Johnson of Canada. And, you know, this was, I mean, it came down to this. Carl Lewis won a bunch of medals and everything. And I was at that event. And from the get-go, Johnson was determined to win this thing. And as he ran by us, it was like you could feel the ground shake. He was going that fast. And it was amazing. And he just blew away the field, left Carl Lewis in the dust. And it was just amazing. That you could just feel this, and the crowd was going nuts, and and we're saying, unbelievable! This is just unbelievable, and I I can still feel that pounding on the earth that you could uh, that seemed to be coming from Ben Johnson's strides as he would hit and, and cross the finish line, and we all knew that this was just uh, out of this world. So what happens is after that they bring out the athlete to meet the media after they take the drug test. So we're back there with the drug test and it usually takes 10, 15 minutes and they bring them out and everything's good. You do your Q and A's and you know, you go on and the athlete goes back to doing what he's doing. Well, it was an unusually long time. It became 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. And we're waiting for Ben Johnson and we're all wondering, okay, what's going on? And the phrase that was spreading around all the reporters was, you know, I will, I'll just tell it like it is, uh, Ben Johnson can't pee. He's got some drugs in his system. Something's going on here. He can't take the drug test, which is all, obviously a urine test. And we're waiting and waiting. And Ben never shows up. Ben never comes out. And they they officials come out and say Ben's not going to come out and uh, everything's fine and you know everything. so so we're thinking okay and we just kind of let it go. Some guys did, some guys didn't. And we got other events to cover. So and and nothing is official come out of this. Because was maybe two days later, it was on the off day, and at that time of the Olympics, the middle day of the Olympics was an off day, no events. Um, basically, it's a break day go tour the land, go meet friends, go have, relax, you know, get the intensity uh, out of your system. And I had made arrangements for the rest of the team to go to Pan Moom Jam on a bus tour. And, you know, I said, look, you guys are here, you're mostly baby boomers. I, while you're here in Korea, you cannot not go to Pan Moom Jam. You're reporters, for gosh sakes. You know, you have to have that experience. You know, the, this is part of our lives growing up. Not only that, but before we became reporters, obviously, because, you know, this happened in the 19... I mean, I was born the same year the Korean War ended, technically, on the, the peace, the uh, ceasefire. So 
but I grew up with that. And we all did. Almost every, well, every one of us did. So I said, look, you're going to go. I made the bus tour. I set the arrangements. Just get on the bus. Go. It's a down day. We don't need you here. So about four o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Washington. And it's my boss at the desk. Washington says, Ben Johnson has fled the country. He failed the drug test. He's left. He's being chased by the world's media. He's in Japan right now. We need you to get up and file some stories. And I said, oh, okay. So he failed the drug test. That's what happened. And so there's pictures on uh, ESPN and CNN of, you know, of uh, Ben Johnson racing through crowds of people at the airport, trying, you know, not answering questions and uh, the world's media microphones everywhere, cameras, all trying to get him to say something, get something, get a glimpse of him. So I went, I wrote the story. I got a, a voicer, you know, a 40 second voice report and I filed it and then I filed a second one. And, and John uh, Tatches also had stayed behind because obviously we didn't need to go to Japan with John. So I woke him up. I said, John, here's the deal. We have to go get some sound. We have to go get some interviews. Well, there was nobody really to interview uh, as far as Ben Johnson's team, but there were Olympic officials. So we headed over to, a front, we were in the Olympic Village, and we headed over to um, the uh, media center and waited for officials to come out and make some sort of statement and then grabbed anybody we could find um other athletes who had raced against ben johnson or knew him or just in general get some comments getting some sort of interviews and we uh we finally got some olympic officials and but uh it was we put out probably 10 to 15 pieces, which was basically all we needed. But uh, John and I just worked, worked the, uh, the place for hours and hours until we had enough material uh, that we could say, okay, uh, we've done enough on this story. We'll you know, take the rest of the day off and get ready for uh, the next day's events. And, but it, it was fascinating. It was like the one day that I scheduled everybody off was the day that the biggest news story came down. And fortunately, there were two of us there that had our wits about us that could go do the story. And, and we covered the story. We covered it like a blanket, you know? And uh, it, it was um, one of those moments that you say, okay, here's where your experience in this field pays off. And you know uh, what to do. And you just go do it. You know, there's no questioning, no humming around. You just, okay, this is what we need to do. Let's go do it, get what we can, and just work it. And we did, and it turned out great. And so the rest of the Olympics was pretty much uneventful. Um, you know, I got to cover the closing ceremonies instead of the opening ceremonies. So I got, and then of course the next Olympics was uh, in um, uh, Spain, Spain or Portugal, I forget. Um, anyway, um, I think it was Lisbon actually. And so uh, we got. I got to go to the closing ceremonies and, you know, the Olympics are now over this Olympiad and, and move on to the next event. And it was fun. It was probably one of the greatest events, if not the greatest event that I've ever covered. And since we were over there, I took my vacation the next week from there. And <laughs> I'll throw in one funny, one final funny story. John and I, uh, and we were, we're good friends, okay? Uh, John was um, married, uh, and I was married, and we had kids and the whole nine yards. But we're really good friends, had been friends for a long time. And so the last night there, we stayed for a week after the Olympics were over, and then he was going to go back to uh, Washington, and I was going to go back to L.A., but I was going to go to China first. Because my wife at the time was going to fly out and meet me. Uh, we were taking a week in Hong Kong and, and uh, spent a day in China and a day in um, – um, uh, the other provinces there and uh, just Macau and, and just, you know, have a good time and take a vacation after this five weeks. So anyway, uh, John and I, we had to leave the Olympic Village. Our stay in the Olympic Village was up, was done. We had to leave. So we had one more night. So we had to find a hotel. And so we we're looking around and um, the Spencer Sherman, who was the local uh in Seoul-based UPI course, water correspondent said, just stay at the Shin Shin. You're just going to be there one night. You know, it's just, it's like 15 bucks for a room. And I said, yeah, it sounds good. Come on, John, you want to go there? He goes, yeah, okay. 
And um, so uh, we made arrangements to go to, and it was in downtown Seoul. And so we made arrangements to, and uh, to stay at the Shinshin. And in the meantime, we had dinner with a, a friend of a friend, a friend of mine in, in LA, his, his um, a brother-in-law and sister were there. And uh, so we had lunch with them. And then we checked into the Shinshin and it was like this huge multi-story hotel, but it was old and it was kind of dinky, right? So um, we're walking up the steps and uh, one of our friends from NPR said, you guys got a, got a couple of rooms? It's kind of booked up here. And I said, no, we got one room. And he goes, you're assuming that there's two beds? <laughs> and John said, yeah, there's not. He goes, I'll find another hotel. And I said, dude, look, we share a bed. You know, it's okay. Uh, one of us will sleep with our back to the wall. And, uh, you know, it will, it, it's, you're going to get up in five hours to go to the airport. And I'm going to get up in seven hours to go to the airport. So, because our flights are different. And, uh, uh, and we're going to meet in Hong Kong, but we had different flights. So that was kind of a strange thing. So, um, we go to the room and the room is maybe 10 by 10 literally had to shimmy around the bed. There was about literally that much room between the bed and the wall. And it was one double bed. And it was like, and it was like one little window, little dinky bathroom and a little chest of drawers. And that was it. And John looks at me and he goes, are you kidding me? And I said, it's 15 bucks. We're going to be here for a few hours, you know? And he goes, all right, I'll sleep on top of the covers you sleep underneath. I said, that's fine with me. <laughs> At least time I slept with any, another guy in my life. So anyway, but it was good. We, um, you know, he put up with my snoring and I, uh, you know, and uh, I remember him getting up and, and leaving and uh, we ended up seeing each other in Hong Kong and telling that story over and over. But it was, it was kind of strange. <laughs> It was like, always check out the hotel before you check in. Uh, anyway, so that's my story on uh, the Seoul Olympics in 1988. And uh, there was a lot more to that Olympics that um, I'm not going to share at the moment, but it was a fun time. And it was really a monumental time for my reporting career and, and in my life. And uh, hopefully you'll join us. Hope you like this story. and You'll join us again for the next episode. Thanks again.